Good afternoon and welcome everybody to today's Qatar Centre virtual seminar. I'm really delighted to welcome today's speaker. Katerina Mendocino is a senior lead economist in the Monetary Policy Research Division at the ECB. She's going to present her work on twin defaults and capital requirements, so a very topical issue, I'd say. Um, we're going to use the normal kind of format for the seminar. So um, if you have any questions during Katerina's talk, please post them in the Q&A box and I'll relay them to Katerina. We'll also try and leave around 10 minutes at the end of the talk for a kind of a wider discussion. So um, do save up your questions. With that, uh, let me hand the floor to Katerina. Katerina, big welcome and over to you. Thank you very much and uh, good afternoon, everyone. It is really great to be here today to present uh, my paper on twin defaults and capital requirements. This is a paper, joint paper with Kalin Nikolov, Juan Rubio Ramirez, Javier Suarez and Dominic Supera. And Dominic is on the market this year, so I guess uh, some of you will have a chance to meet him. Uh, okay. So uh, the motivation of this paper, so the main focus of this paper is on the optimal level of bank capital requirement. And this is a question which, are, which has received a great deal of attention, at least since the global financial crisis, when uh, in the absence of an appropriate macroprudential framework, most developed economies experienced uh, high borrowers default and abnormally high levels of bank insolvencies which depressed economic activity on a scale never witnessed before. So there is a general consensus that bank capital is the best way to protect both individual institutions and the aggregate economy against the risk of bank insolvencies. However, more than a decade after the global financial crisis, there is still no consensus about the appropriate level of bank capital requirements which uh, still remains an open question and is, as I say, the main focus of uh, this paper. So uh, many in the profession argue that for significantly higher capital requirements as a way to reduce the frequency of bank insolvencies and bring significant benefits for the society. Others are instead more conscious because uh, increasing capital requirement may come at the cost of restricting bank credit provision in normal times, and especially so when banks' capacity to raise equity is limited. Um, so overall, it seems that in order to assess the optimal level of capital requirement, one needs to take into account the trade-off between the cost and benefits associated to an increase in capital requirements, where the costs are generally associated to uh, a lower availability of credit to the broader economy, while the benefits are related to, to the ability of higher capital requirements to avoid the costly bank solvency crisis. So capturing this trade-off between cost and benefits is actually challenging though. And it is challenging because it requires a framework which is, that is suitable not only to capture the behavior of the economy in normal times. And uh, by normal times here, I really mean uh, business cycle fluctuations characterized by regular uh, periods of expansions and recessions which follow one another, but also um, uh, the, the same framework needs to be able to also capture the behavior of the economy during bank insolvency crisis, which are characterized by very deep recessions and high default rates among banks. Um, now, uh, this paper um, focuses on the fact that bank insolvency crises are not only associated to uh, abnormally high defaults among banks, but also to very high defaults among banks' borrowers. And uh, uh, although this uh, might be surprising to you, um, it is actually macro models in which bank solvency problems endogenously arise from the performance of the, their borrowers are still largely missing. So, and we think that this leaves an important gap, which uh, our paper tries to fill. 
And um, the main method of the paper is that capturing the frequency and severity of episodes of simultaneously high borrower bank defaults, which we term twin defaults, is important for the assessment of the net benefits of higher bank capital requirements. And this is because although these twin defaults are rare as episodes, they impose very large debt losses on the society because they combine the debt losses associated to bank defaults with those associated to the default of bank borrowers. And so this uh, um, greatly exacerbates the welfare losses uh, associated with bank insolvencies. So I'm going to provide a preview of the results. And uh, basically, I'm going to emphasize two main findings. The first is that taking into account uh, the link between bank solvency risk and the solvency of bank borrowers in a way that it's consistent with the special nature of bank asset risk um, uh, helps to reproduce the nonlinear relationship between firm bank defaults and GDP growth, which we observe in the data, but also the frequency and severity of twin defaults themselves. And in addition, getting the probability of twin defaults right and the economic losses associated with them is of first order importance when drawing conclusions on the optimal level of bank capital requirements. So, uh, the optimal increase in bank capital requirement is substantially larger in our framework than under alternative specifications, which instead overlook the impact of borrower default on bank default. And um, um, let me just provide a quick overview of the presentation. So I'm going to provide, uh, I'm going to tell you um, in some details about the structural general equilibrium model of bank default risk, which we build, uh, that microfounds the link between borrower and bank default risk and embeds it into an otherwise standard quantitative macro framework. Uh, then I'm going to document uh, that the quantitative properties of the model are actually in line with the data in a number of relevant dimensions, including the frequency and severity of twin defaults. And finally, I'm going to show that um, the optimal capital requirement crucially depends on the impact of borrower default on bank solvency. And in terms of our contribution, we broadly contribute to the macro finance literature. Um, from a normative perspective, we contribute to this um, recent and growing trend of the literature, which aims at assessing the impact of changes in bank capital requirements. And in particular, we, he, he, we contribute to this literature by showing uh, that bank capital requirements depend on the impact of borrower default on bank default. And more broadly, from a modeling perspective, we also contribute to the larger literature on credit frictions and banks in general equilibrium. And um, by here, we our main contribution is to show that what are the implications of catch, capturing the special structure of bank asset risk in a structural way. And one of these implications is that bank default risk is actually a strong determinant of the economy downside risk. And um, in this, uh, this is what connects us also with the um, literature on fin uh, financial vulnerabilities. And finally, uh, our paper also links to the um, large literature on the importance of non-linearities for financial crisis. And in particular here, we uh, contribute, complement existing papers by showing that the non-linearity in bank asset returns also play an important role for the insurgence of bank solvency crisis. And uh, um, if there are, if there is any question, maybe clarifying question, maybe this is a good moment to ask. Uh, otherwise, I will uh, jump in directly into the model. Maybe one very, um, this is a question from me, Katerina. So um, perhaps you could clarify, is this, is this like a steady state analysis you'll be doing or will you be thinking about transition dynamics as well? 
maybe if you could say a word about that. Uh, so this is an excellent question, David. So in, um, uh, this is a, a stochastic model, the one that I will present. Um, so we will focus on uh, the stochastic mean of the, the impact of changes in capital, uh, capital requirements on the stochastic mean of the model. And this is because uh, aggregate shocks are also important determinants of, um, of default. Um, so, but, um, uh, so um, in this sense, we take into account the stochastic nature of the model. However, in the, in the results I'm going to show you today, I'm not going to talk about the, um, the transition to higher capital requirements. Although this is a very important element to be, which introduces an additional trade-off between the cost that can happen in the short run and the benefits which materialize more in the medium to long run. So, um, very good. For today, maybe we can talk more later about this, uh, but for today, I will uh, abstract from, uh, uh, the, from the transition. Fair enough. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. So, let me tell you a bit about the model. Uh, in the model, we have a representative long-lived household, which provide consumption insurance through three type of members. There are the workers, which supply labor to the production sector. And then there are uh, entrepreneurs and bankers, which are equity providers for firms and banks, respectively. So in each period, some entrepreneurs and bankers become workers and some workers become entrepreneurs and bankers. And so the, the assumption here is that the measure of each uh, type of households remain cost, constant for simplicity. Um, so the worker operates in a pretty standard way and the entrepreneur and bankers, so whenever they, at the beginning of their activity, they receive an initial endowment from the household. household. And then uh, they need to rely on their own network to keep providing uh, equities to the production and the banking sector. And it is only at the end of the period that they turn at the end of their activity, that is not the end of the period, they, they live for more than a period, um, that they transfer the accumulated net worth back to the household. So what is really important here is that uh, both entrepreneurs and bankers operate with limited net worth. And um, this is an assumption that we are going to discuss in the probably in the next slide, but it's a very important one. Uh, which uh, um, allow for the modeling of uh, external financing or also for both firms and banks. And um, one clarification, in the presentation today, I'm going to um, focus on the link between uh, the default risk of banks uh, and their borrowers, mainly corporate borrowers. So I've, the focus will be on firms. But the same mechanism which I illustrate today can be applied also to other type of borrowers, for instance, to other type of loans and borrowers, such as uh, mortgages, for instance. Um, so the household, um, oh, as I said, it operates in a pretty standard way. So um, it just maximizes the discounted future stream of utility. Uh, and it, at, the, at the beginning of each period, the household can decide how much to deposit in the bank, how much to consume, and uh, how much to, to supply in terms of hours worked. And then the household receives the wage income and the repayment on uh, on the deposit on last year the last uh, period deposit and uh, this additional two terms represent the first represents the aggregate net transfer from the entrepreneurs and bankers and the second instead is the lump sum tax which we introduce in order to balance the budget of the deposit insurance scheme as I'm going to discuss in a second, um, the model uh, assumes that there is deposit insurance. Um, regarding firms and banks, um, they, they share some similarities. And in particular, firms and banks are both ex identical to their own type. 
So ex ante, all forms are identical and all banks are identical, but they are different from each other. And uh, they both issue equity among their equity providers, which are entrepreneurs for firms and bankers for banks. And uh, both entrepreneurs and bankers, as I said, operate under limited net worth. And uh, this means that the firms and the banks uh, cannot satisfy their financing needs only through um, uh, equities. Uh, they need to uh, also uh, use external financing, which uh, it's, we model in the form of loans for firms and deposits for banks. And uh, with respect to this external financing, they operate under limited liability and can default on their own debt of obligations. So in the case of default, uh, the debtors repossess the assets of the firms and the banks. However, uh, uh, default uh, it's uh, bring some bank uh, some um, economic costs uh, which are considered debt weight losses to the society um so uh, here obviously the assumption of uh, limited net worth is uh, uh, very important uh, and um, uh, the way we model this is by assuming that entrepreneurs and bankers cannot rise outside equities from the households. So they only receive the initial endowment and then the model operates under a shortage of equity, basically. Um, now, going more into the details, uh, firms use equities and bank loans to finance their input of production. This is a standard Cap Douglas production function. Uh, so uh, they use capital, purchase capital and rent, rent labor to produce uh, the final good. And hey, here is the productivity shock, all very standard. And um, as I said, external financing takes the form of bank loans. And um, as we hear, this is uh, uh, this part, it's um, more standard in the literature. So we uh, explicitly model the contracting problem between the bank and the firms, which means that the banks in our model endogenously price the default risk of their borrowers. And um, as you can think of, if you are familiar with uh, Bernanke, Gertler and Gilchrist, you can think of a bank which offers a schedule of interest rate for different leverage choices of the firm. So the firms internalize the expected cost of default in their leverage choice. And um, this is a, a point, uh, a, an important point that, that will really differentiate our modeling of firms and banks. And uh, in fact, banks, similarly to firms, banks also issue um, equities and uh, uh, use deposits to give loans to firms. And uh, they, they don't produce, but they uh, supply loans to firms. And they operate up subject to a capital requirement. So the bank is restricted by regulation to back with equity funding at least a fraction of the loans. But uh, uh, differently from firms, banks operate under safety net guarantees, which we model in the form of insured deposits. So this means that all banks uh, uh, pay the same, same interest rate to depositors, uh, regardless of their riskness. So the risk profile of the individual bank is not priced by the depositors. And this implies that the bank has an incentive to lever up to the, to the maximum. Um, and it's a crucial difference between firms and banks. The, the, as, you, as, you, uh, as you see, there is no uh, explicit contract uh, between the bank and the depositors. Um, another uh, assumption is uh, an important assumption from, from our framework is the segmentation of the lending market in islands. So. Uh, you can think of islands as regions or sectors. And um, here the idea is that a bank can only grant loans to the continuum of firms in a specific island, which is the operational area of the, of the bank. 
And uh, this market segmentation only applies to the credit market. So the output and the factor of productions and are all freely mobile across islands. And also the funding is not island specific. So every both equities and deposits are not island specific. Every period, the bankers decide how much net worth to invest in a portfolio of equity of the continuum of banks. And the, the, there are indeed a continuum of islands and so a continuum of banks. And uh, um, so, uh, let me just, let's now assume that, uh, um, let's now look into the problem of the firm and the, and the bank. And in particular, uh, what I'm going to show you is that uh, um, by solving the problem of the firm, um, what uh, comes out is that the, the, um, the firm optimally defaults if the terminal value of its assets are ins insufficient to pay back uh, the loans that the firm has with a given bank. So let's uh, focus on a bank I living on an island J. Uh, so uh, this firm is going to default if uh, the, um, the value of its assets plus production is not enough to repay the debt where B it BR times B is the, the uh, loan plus repayment. Um, and here K as I said is capital and this is the production function instead. Now, uh, as you can see, this firm can actually default for aggregate reasons and uh, these aggregate reasons are mainly uh, changes in productivity uh, or a massive drop in the price of capital which would lead the firm to be better off by defaulting, or also by idiosyncratic reasons. And the idiosyncratic reasons here are um, modeled through the, these omegas. There is an omega i and an omega j. So these are shocks which are log normally distributed and are iid, which affect directly the asset returns of the firm. And um, the omega i in blue is a form of idiosyncratic shock. So this is a shock that is in a idiosyncratic way the continuum of firms operating, living in the same island. Uh, so uh, um, imagine there are two firms, just focus on two firms in the same island. Uh, if a bad realization of, of this shock, it's the performance of, of one of the firms. And so can triggers the decision of this firm to, de to default. Um, it, it might, it doesn't affect at all the decision of the second firm to, to default or to repay the debt. So it's really idiosyncratic across firms. Uh, the second shock instead is an island specific shock that is the omega j in red, uh, which um, the, that is modeled in as an um, idiosyncratic shock across islands. So this shock, it's all firms within an island in the same way. So in the example of the two firms, both of them might be hit by, by a bad realization of this shock. Now, from the point of view of the firm, there is no distinction between these two shocks. The firm is hit by one idiosyncratic shock and it doesn't matter if it is the firm specific or the island specific. Whereas from the point of view of the bank, it makes a huge difference because the firm idiosyncratic shock uh, is diversifiable from the point of view of the bank. Where, uh, because the bank can lend to the continuum of firms in the same island. Whereas the, Island specific shock, it is not. And this is because the, the uh, bank operating in a given island can only lend to the firms within this island. So banks cannot lend across islands and so cannot diversify this idiosyncratic shock. And I see David here, so I guess there is a question. It's a very quick clarification question that came up in our Q&A box. This is from someone who didn't leave their name, but the question was, 
basically whether corporate borrowers located on one island could have exposure to people outside of the island. And does that is that type of kind of cross jurisdictional exposure does that feature in the model? I think it's kind of implicit in the way you've set it up, but but if you could answer that. Yeah, uh, this is a good question. So uh, the firm, um, so the output of production of the firm and the inputs of production are not Thailand specific. So these are the level of the wider economy, let's say. Uh, there is no segmentation in the labor market, in the capital market, um, and also in the... Um, in the final good market. But the, a firm uh, located in an island can only borrow from the bank located in the same island. So this is the only restriction. Uh, for the, um, the, the modeling of the relation between, the macro foundation of the relation between borrowers and banks, we don't need to be so, to, to have, um, to make all markets being uh, island specific. So there is no segmentation in the other markets. It's a little credit market. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Let's now move into the, the bank. So uh, here we also, I mean, we can also characterize the optimal default decision of banks as being uh, linked to, to um, to the uh, ability of to the long returns uh, to basically so it's, it's pretty similar to the one of the firm and in this case the asset returns of the bank are the returns on the portfolio of loans and uh, the bank uh, the banks can optimally decide to default when the loan returns are not enough to repay for deposits and um, here, what we can show, what we show in the paper is that this is a nonlinear function of the omega j, the non-diversifiable island shock. And um, also, uh, what we can show is that banks in our model default only when a large number of uh, uh, their borrowers default. And this is why we, uh, uh, we refer to this type of solvency crisis as twin defaults. And um, the island setup is a very tractable way to model ex uh, the exposed heterogeneous performance in the bank default outcome. So as I said, all banks are exempt identical, as well as all firms are exempt identical. But here it is important to have heterogeneity in the performance, both of the firms and the banks in terms of default outcomes, um, because uh, um, otherwise, uh, uh, by having a representative bank which default, the whole system collapses, so it, it becomes an extreme case. And um, the, the island setup allows us to model this heterogeneity uh, in terms of default outcomes in a very tractable way. And importantly, it is also consistent with bank asset being debt claims with limited payoff, which I'm going to illustrate next. So basically, on the left hand side, I'm going to show you, I'm showing you the bank asset returns as a function of the island shock. I just want to illustrate how the, the, this island nonlinearity of bank asset returns, the nonlinearity of bank asset returns in terms of the island shock. And uh, the idea here, it's quite simple. So we have banks which hold a portfolio of risky loans and the payoff on this portfolio looks very much like a smooth version of the um, payoff on a debt security. So in good times, uh, which are related to good realization of the island shock, uh, the bank receive the uh, promise repayment. So we are on this flat part of the, of the curve. But for lower realizations of the um, omega j of the island shock, we start approach, approaching the cliff. Um, which, uh, so what this means is that basically we, we approach the cliff and then we fall through this cliff because lower and lower realization of the island shock 
deteriorate the performance of the borrowers and more and more firms start defaulting. So the bank needs to repossess the assets of these uh, firms, which also um, which also face some recovery cost. And uh, of course, the, um, the repossession of the asset and the value of the assets of a defaulting firm is uh, lower than the uh, pre-agreed payoff. Um, so here is where you clearly see the, the non-linearity in bank asset return. You clearly see how the island shock and the island setup uh, generate this non-linearity in bank asset returns. And um, this is important because uh, it's uh, going to generate a distribution of bank asset returns, which is asymmetric, in particular is uh, left skewed and uh, it features fat tails. So which again tells that in most of the times we are in good times, the bank gets uh, the pre-agreed repayment, but then uh, the, the bank is exposed to downside risk and um, the, what we see here, what this left skewed and fat tail represent is basically capture the fact that uh, there are episodes in which the returns on the loan portfolio start falling and uh, a, a lar a, an increasing number of borrowers start defaulting and so also the default rates of banks spikes up. and. Um, Again, just to emphasize that all this is endogenously produced uh, by the island setup uh, which we designed. And now let's briefly check, okay, what would be the alternative? Imagine we don't have this island setup, so there will be no Omega J. As I said, this could just be a representative bank. There would be no heterogeneity in terms of um, defaults of, uh, of the banking sector. And um, a standard way in um, macro finance models is to assume for, for sorry, for a standard way to introduce this heterogeneity uh, it's to assume that there are idiosyncratic shocks which directly affect the returns on the loan portfolio of the banks. So now instead of the returns are till they being a function of the omega j, they would ju just be a shock affecting them. So this is a quite popular way assumption in macro finance models, and and it is popular because it's very convenient uh, um, because you can find uh, uh, analytical solutions. So the model is very. Um, uh, tractable. However, it has two disadvantages. The first is that um, uh, in this setup, uh, banks can default also when their borrowers uh, uh, repay in full, because you see there is nothing properly affecting the, the return on the loans, but the bank defaults, defaults because it has a bad realization of the idiosyncratic shock. And um, most importantly, um, bank assets are more like equity-like claims with unlimited upside. And this has also important implications for bank default. So here I'm going to, I'm showing you again the bank asset returns and the distribution of bank asset returns in our framework. And um, the same object in the alternative framework with the shock directly eating the uh, loan returns for banks, which I'm going to call uh, reduced form uh, modeling of uh, or Merton type or reduced form modeling of bank default risk. And Merton type, because this really resembles, this um, modeling way really resembles the Merton model of corporate default. So as you can see, bank asset returns here are very linear. So, uh, and um, for good realizations of the idiosyncratic shock to the um, re uh, returns of banks, um, the bank can even get more than the pre-agreed repayment. So in good times, what uh, um, other authors, and, and namely Nagel and Purnanandam have showed, is that in good times, this type of models underestimate the distance to default of uh, banks. And in addition, um, 
uh, this type of models also generate a distribution of bank asset returns, which is symmetric. So it, it is much more difficult for this type of models to produce episodes of very high uh, default rates, which are very severe, but very at the same time, very rare which instead we can, uh, I'm going to show you, we can match pretty well with our model. Um, so time, okay, let me move to the quantitative properties of the model. And uh, before looking into the um, optimal level of bank capital requirement, I want to show you that the quantitative properties of the model are actually in line with the data in a number of relevant dimensions. Now, uh, since we are mainly interested in uh, business cycle fluctuations and in um, crisis periods, we focus on uh, basically on aggregate fluctuations, so macroeconomic and financial variables. So we need to augment our model with aggregate shocks. Uh, this means that in addition to the two idiosyncratic uh, sources of default risk, which are the diversifiable and non-diversifiable um, idiosyncratic shock, we also introduce three sources of aggregate flotations, which are the standard productivity shock, and then two risk shocks. And these risk shocks, uh, which are nowadays quite popular, are shocks to the standard deviation of idiosyncratic shocks. Um, you find these shocks in many papers. They are usually called risk shocks or uncertainty shocks. Now here, the main, uh, the main uh, uh, feature is that we have two types of these risk shocks. One to the standard deviation of the firm idiosyncratic shock, and, and the other to the standard deviation of the island specific shock. And uh, you will see soon uh, why this is important. So uh, as a first thing, I want to show you the very briefly going into the uh, ability of the model to match unconditional moments, which we target in the, for the model calibration. So we use quarterly macro banking and financial data for the euro area, and then we target the moments reported in this table to calibrate some of the model parameters. And um, uh, we use mainly means and standard deviations, so macro and uh, financial variables. But I want to focus your attention on the, in the interest of time, on the correlation between bank and firm default. So as you see, this is positive in the data and also in the model. So the model reproduces well the fact that the two defaults are positively correlated. And uh, this is something that cannot be matched with uh, the Merton type reduced form default risk model. Um, and I will illustrate this in a second. But uh, in addition um, to being uh, positive, this correlation is also, um, it display, displays uh, su substantial non-linearity. And um, one point of the paper is that taking into account the special nature of bank asset risk, which features limited upside but significant downside risk, helps to reproduce this non-linear relationship between firm default, bank default, and GDP growth. So now one way of seeing this is through quantile regressions. Here, this is a simple quantile regression that uses uh, Moody's expected uh, default frequency for banks and firms. And here we're just running a um, regression by the different quantiles of bank default. And uh, as you see, the first thing you can observe is that the Quantile coefficient is uh, displays uh, some nonlinearity, and in particular, uh, at the bottom quantiles of default of bank default. So when we are in good times, and the risk of bank failure is low, uh, the relation between bank default and firm default is pretty weak. On, on the contrary, when uh, banks are more vulnerable and this, uh, the, when banks are more vulnerable, they display a uh, higher sensitivity to firm default risk. So once banks have a high risk of failure, the marginal impact of credit losses, of additional credit losses on bank solvency is much higher than in normal times. 
This is what we see in the data. And then we run similar regressions using our model simulated data. And what we find is that the model, our model can actually match the fact that the correlation between bank and firm defaults is increasing with the bank default rate. And the model is the black line. Um, now, why did I say that the alternative approach doesn't really do a good job in matching this correlation? It's uh, here I'm illustrating this. It's the green, these are the results uh, displayed uh, in the green line. So in this alternative model, uh, the, the default rate between the, the correlation between the two defaults is uh, first of all close to zero, if not zero. And then uh, it displays, it doesn't display any relevant nonlinearity. Um, so of course there could be way of uh, increasing this uh, correlation to some positive val val values, maybe through some uh, exogenous correlation of the shocks, but this will not introduce any time variation, which is the most, uh, the crucial factor to be able to capture episodes of uh, high default rates of both firms and banks, which are very severe, but also very rare. And uh, just to conclude this part, I'm also going to show you some the results of uh, quantile regressions we look, which look at the impact of, of bank and firm defaults on next period GDP growth. So, because ultimately we are interested in the impact on the on the economic impact. So, the solid line here displays the quantile regressions run using um, data, uh, where as a measure of financial conditions we use bank default. While the dashed line reproduces the same type of regression, but uh, um, using the firm defaults. And these are very similar in the similar spirit as the. Um, uh, quantile regressions in the uh, American Economic Review by Adrian Boyarchenko and Giannone. There they use the index of financial conditions, which is a summary index of financial conditions. Here, since we are interested in comparing with our model counterpart, we use the, the main me measures of uh, financial conditions in our model data, bank default and firm default. So as you see, uh, on average, if you look at the median results, on average, bank insolvencies do not really matter for next period GDP growth. But in uh, low quintiles, when uh, uh, which characterize crisis times or recessions, what we see is that there is a much higher sensitivity of next period GDP growth to bank default. And um, the same type of linear, non-linearity is not really observed in terms of your default. You have something, but this is really not uh, um, uh, not uh, remarkable and also not significant, actually, the difference between the median and the uh, bottom quintiles of GDP growth. And uh, here instead we run the same regressions using the model simulated data. And what we see is that the model does a fantastic job actually in reproducing the nonlinearity between the sensitivity of next period GDP growth and bank default. Um, and uh, uh, so what is very important is that all this is not targeted. So the model, the only targeted moments are those that you have seen in the initial table, the means, the unconditional means and standard deviation. And all the rest is like implied by, uh, by the, the model at that initial calibration. Um, so if there is some question, I can take it now, maybe. Otherwise, I will move into the... I think why don't you continue for another five minutes to to the end, and then we'll have a, a discussion at that stage, Catherine. Okay. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Now, uh, the second thing is that in terms of quantitative results, is that the model also captures quite well the frequency sensibility of twin defaults that we observe in the data. And here you can see here what we, we do is uh, we slice the data into three 
regions. So we consider periods of low defaults, uh, periods of high firm defaults, and periods of uh, twin defaults, where both firm and bank defaults are high. So by high levels of default, I mean defaults above the 19th percentile of the expected default probability, Moody's expected default probability. And uh, so we do this with the data and also uh, look at the model implied, uh, model implications for these three regimes. First of all, the model reproduces remarkably well the frequency of these three regimes, meaning that most times we are in good times. And then uh, with a much, much lower probability, we can be in regimes of uh, high firm defaults, which are generally uh, normalizations or twin defaults, which are uh, crisis periods. And uh, another important uh, uh, fact is that the, there is also, in addition to, okay, this is what the model matches. And uh, uh, the, what are the um, macroeconomic implications? So, um, as you can see, there is a clear ranking between these three regimes in the data. Uh, of course, uh, GDP growth falls uh, uh, more during period of high def firm defaults than low defaults, but remarkably more during periods of twin defaults. And the model can actually reproduce this uh, quite well. Uh, reasonably well. And um, importantly, this difference between the firm default regime, high firm default regime and twin default regimes is uh, mainly linked uh, to the difference in terms of bank uh, default rates, because the firm default rates are about the same in the two regimes, but bank default rates are remar remarkably higher. I'm going to skip this and just uh, tell you a bit, uh, um, so what are the factors that engender twin defaults in our model? So after having documented that the quantitative properties of the model are in line with the data, are generally good, we want to know what is the, what in our model generates these episodes of twin default crisis. And by doing so, I'm going to show that the structural link between the solvency of firms of, and banks constitute a powerful amplification mechanism. And um, I will illustrate this uh, using this figure, which uh, um, displays on the top panel the dynamics of output, bank default and firm defaults uh, in, two, in the uh, regime characterized by high bank and firm defaults, which is um, depicted by the red line. And uh, the episode instead, instead characterized just by high firm defaults, which uh, are reported uh, in blue. So as, I mean, unsurprisingly, uh, what you saw in the table, you, will, you are also uh, seeing here, output falls much more during uh, episodes of uh, twin defaults compared to just uh, periods of uh, high default rates of firms. <laughs> But what is uh, uh, really interesting is uh, what is in the model, how can the model generate this, uh, distinguish between these two type of uh, written episodes? And uh, what are the sources of these two type of episodes? So here uh, you see TFP doesn't really play any role in generating this um, default episodes, uh, whereas the um, re island risk and the firm idiosyncratic risk are the main factors be behind these two type of regimes. Mm -hmm. uh, but very importantly here is that high default rates among firms can be produced both using the, both by the idiosyncratic, firm idiosyncratic risk shock or the island risk shock, whereas the twin default episodes are really linked to the occurrence of island risk, island risk shocks. And um, here what you can see, what the red line shows you is that um, the, the, these twin defaults are generated really by a sequence of small negative island risk shocks, that, which become increasingly amplified 
when the pro- with, with the, an increase in the probability of bank default. So as the probability of bank failure grows, small shock can have more and more severe consequences. And uh, what I want to stress here is that uh, this is not a very large shock. So the model can reproduce very high default rates of banks and firms, at least in line with what we have seen in the data during the financial crisis, the sovereign debt crisis. But uh, the shock itself is up to 1.5 standard deviations. So it is really the amplification mechanism driven by, um, generated by the non-linearity in bank asset returns, which plays an important uh, role in the model, uh, in amplifying uh, these uh, uh, aggregate shocks. And uh, finally, I want to just conclude with the policy insights. So uh, we started the the presentation talking about the optimal level of capital requirements. And here I'm going to tell you, okay, what are the implications of our model in terms of optimal level of capital requirements? And uh, this figure reports the ergodic mean of the household welfare as a function of the level of capital requirements. 8% is the initial level at the calibrated uh, in the in the calibrated model and then we see that by increasing capital requirements we have initially an increase in household welfare and this is because higher capital requirements make banks more resilient to credit losses and uh, hence higher capital requirement to reduce the negative impact of firm default on bank default, and in turn also the impact of twin defaults, which become less likely on the the welfare of the economy. Uh, However, when bank capital are already quite high, keep increasing them, it's uh, only costly, Uh, reduces the welfare, um, the the overall benefits of uh, capital requirements. And this is because capital higher capital requirements also um, are related to a higher cost of funds for banks because equities are more considered in debt. And so higher capital requirements translate into higher borrowing costs for firms and a lower equilibrium level of credit. And so overall, the model would prescribe that the optimal level of capital requirements is around 15%. Now, we don't attach any particular meaning to the exact level. What is more important is the optimal increase. So we start from 8% and the optimal is almost double the initial level. So the optimal increase is very large. And uh, this is very much related to the fact that bank defaults in our model occur together with uh, uh, the default of the bank borrowers, which uh, um, make bank bank solvency crisis much more severe and costly compared to other models. So for instance, in the Merton type version of our model, we would see that the optimal increase in capital requirement is about two percentage points, whereas the, the full model with the endogenous mechanism, endogenous link between firm and bank defaults would imply um, a doubling of the initial level. And with this, I think I can conclude and um, just leave the conclusion slides here. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Katerina. Um, yeah. Okay, so you've timed that really well. So we have a few minutes for questions. So if any of you have a question, um, you can either type it in the Q and A box, or you can kind of I can give you the mic and you can ask your question directly. I'm going to kind of kick off with a couple myself, if that's okay. Um, one is just a clarification, actually, on that really nice, that striking kind of hump shape curve you showed us at the end. Um, And I guess my question is, should we think of those numbers as like leverage ratio numbers or as risk-weighted capital numbers? So is is this the optimal kind of equity to asset ratio or equity to risk-weighted asset ratio, if if that makes sense? Perhaps you want to answer that one first. Uh, sorry, meanwhile something happened, so I oh. heard that. Uh, my my um, 
Zoom uh, is connected and then connected again. But you were asking if uh, the capital requirement here is uh, the leverage ratio and or the... Yeah, that's right. So my question is like, should we think of these numbers on the bottom, like 14, 15% as like equity to assets or as equity to risk weighted assets? Um, um, so we like to think in terms of equity to risk weighted assets because, uh, but okay, first, first answer, this is the way we like to think about this, but it's true that in the model doesn't really make a difference because we only have one type of asset. But we also perform a similar analysis in, uh, in a model which has more than one type of loan. So we see that also there, the results go through. So this is why I said um, it's, um, we do not attach any particular meaning to the 15%. The message we want to give is that if you take into account the fact that bank defaults or it's linked to the performance of the bank borrowers, the optimal increase in capital requirement, it's larger than what uh, otherwise uh, you could, yeah. other models could, uh, could predict. Uh, and this would always be the case uh, in both ways of modeling uh, requirements. Let me ask you another one. So this is from Armit de, Ro de Riol. Armit, I apologize if I mispronounced your name. <clears throat> um, so the question here is about, it's kind of a question about interconnectedness, I think. So, um, you know, in reality, we know kind of bank defaults are sometimes driven by exposures between banks. So maybe I, I might kind of broaden the question out. So, you know, there's a range of, you know, your model is beautifully simple and you've managed to kind of distill a lot of kind of things going on and a lot of things that are important for reality into a kind of a seemingly a very tract tractable model. But it, you therefore have to abstract from some things like bank interconnectedness. I mean, I guess we could add like liquidity risk as another thing. You know, I don't think there are depositors running from banks in the framework or banks that are suffering kind of credit lines that are being drawn. How should you think about these like things outside the model? Would they kind of be pushing you kind of further to the right in terms of capital, optimal capital, or do, would you have a different interpretation? Um, so, yeah, okay, correct. Uh, we abstract from many features of reality, and uh, in particular, as you said, we abstract from RAMs. That could be many ways of modeling them. And, um, and this is for simplicity. So maybe for what concerns liquidity issue, we already know, I mean, there are other instruments in place. So in order to, rather than focusing on how capital requirements can uh, also address questions related to liquidity risk. Maybe it could be very interesting to look at the interaction between different type of tools. And um, that would be super interesting, actually. Um, regarding the interconnectedness, also here we don't model that for, um, for simplicity because that, I mean, the framework is already a bit convoluted, <laughs> quite a bit. Um, the, the only thing I can tell you is that, um, so, so there is, of course, no big interlinkages between uh, uh, the banks in different Thailand. It's only through general equilibrium effects. But when some banks default on a given island, this is going to have spillovers over, um, over time uh, because it's going to affect the return on equities of, uh, of the bankers and uh, their accumulation of net worth. So next period, it's going to have an impact on the availability of equity of the bankers for the all banking sector. So there is persistence in default outcomes which is driven by the fact that uh, we have, uh, uh, it is only the credit market which is segmented, but then uh, the equity market and the deposit funding, it is not. So there is a general equilibrium effect uh, uh, through that. I see. I but see. the explicit modeling of the interlinkages between uh, banks uh, in different islands is of would of course be great, fascinating. <laughs> totally. Maybe like one last question from me then. So I'm kind of wondering whether there's like a 
a macro prudential kind of motivation in this model. So is there a sense in which maybe I can frame it in terms of like, if you could, would you like to be able to vary the capital requirement kind of dynamically over the cycle? Is that what the kind of planner would choose? Or is it actually just kind of setting a kind of a constant level as the is the kind of optimal policy in this in this setup? Do you, I don't know if you've looked at that, but if even if not, do you have a kind of a speculation as to how it would work? Um, so, in uh, previous work, um, where we were not using this uh, model, uh, um, but actually the Merton type model. This is why we know the comparison pretty well. Right. Um, what we can show, and I believe this result would still be uh, robust, is that um, the level of capital requirement is what matters the most. And um, the, the gains that you get from counter-cyclical type of policy, there are gains, of course, but these gains are of a minor extent. And this is because once you have reduced uh, the, um, once you make banks uh, very safe, exante, uh, through changes in the level of capital requirement, then uh, the additional gain that can come from the uh, cyclical component are minor because banks are already uh, resilient, quite much more resilient to shocks. So if you compare the resilience of banks at 8% or 14 or 13%, you see that banks are much more resilient to aggregate shocks at 13 or 14%. And so, of course, there are gains from uh, changes in capital requirements, but are uh, um, less sizable. And I believe this results would also hold uh, here. Yeah. So one need to think of um, different type of motives for uh, really having uh, or level policies which are not optimal, then uh, uh, you would, could still have big gains. If it's not possible to change the capital requirements, the level of capital requirements, uh, then uh, the cyclical policy would still have uh, would still be important. Um, that makes sense. Yeah, you need that to be some sort of cost of having high requirements through the cycle, so that it's not optimal to be at that super yeah. resilient position. We've, um, I think, we've allocated all the the time. So, Katerina, thank you so much. That was a really really exciting presentation. Thanks for sharing your paper with us and keep in touch. And thanks everyone who participated. See you in a couple of weeks. Thank you very much, David. Bye everyone.